Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So yes, I'm only a month into filming videos and I'm already changing the layout of my monthly reading wrap-up. I was just finding the process of filming the big end of month wrap-ups to be just a little bit stressful. In fact, I'd probably go as far as to say that they were the most stressful videos to film so far because I was having to balance trying to give enough of a review of every single book that I read whilst also competing with the fact that I am naturally not the most eloquent speaker and I do stumble of my words and have to do a lot of takes to get all of my sentences out. I'm quite forgetful so books that I read near the beginning of the month if they weren't absolute standout to me I often forget like the little details that I wanted to include into a review. All of that competing with the fact that I don't actually have that much storage on my phone on my iPhone which I film on so I'm trying to get all of this out in as short a video as possible and it just was not happening and it was leading to me panicking a little bit in the process of filming these videos and I don't want that at all, I want this to be a fun process. So I thought, you know, split these monthly wrap-ups up, do one mid-month, one at the end of the month, and then it's just the best of both worlds. Hopefully that's all right for you and now into the books that I have read in the first half of June. As normal, starting with a few books that were either rereads for me or books that I want to do justice to in a longer video. Firstly, we have Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. Shakespeare's famous play about the Roman general who starts to engage in politics only to find that he is not at all suited to it and disastrous events occur. I watched and read this along with the National Theatre's production of Coriolanus starring Tom Hiddleston that was put up on YouTube a couple of weeks ago and absolutely loved it. I think I had read Coriolanus uh, back in university like very very briefly and I, I must have not read it properly or must have just skimmed it that week because I didn't remember this at all but I really, really enjoyed it. It gave me so much to think about politics and the personality that is best suited to politics. Is it somebody who is competent versus somebody who is a performer? Discussion on pride and class and all sorts of different things. So I really do want to do this justice in a longer video. I just need to sit down and script it. And I'm probably gonna give it another read before I do that. Next this month, a big highlight was rereading The Song of Achilles. Now this was slightly prompted by the fact that one of my friends mentioned how much she loved this, but also because Sylvie from the TBR Diaries mentioned this in her Books I Want to Reread video as being a book that is probably one of her favourites. I read this I think end of last year and I thought it was very good but it wasn't an absolute standout book but when I went back to this oh my gosh oh my gosh this is fantastic and I cried I cried. <laughs> This tells the story of the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus from the Trojan War, who we will know from the Iliad. How they met, became friends, in this instance they do become lovers and then they eventually go to the Trojan War. It is absolutely devastating and I loved it, I loved it so so much. I really highly recommend that you read this, it is just stunning. And side note, I don't remember Odysseus being such a dick last time I read this. He is horrible. <laughs> he is so bad. Uh, Odysseus is a character that I always really enjoy in literature, but he, he was just the worst. He was the absolute worst. This has put me down a little bit of a spiral into reading ancient Greek myth retellings, and I've also picked up Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey because I, I, I feel like I want to go back to liking Odysseus because I've always liked him whenever I've read things about him. So We'll see, we'll see how we go. And then my last reread so far this month has been The Binding by Bridget Collins. It tells the story of Emmett Farmer who is taken on as an apprentice to a bookbinder after he has become much too ill to work on his family's farm. In this world, people go to bookbinders in order to forget uh, rather damaging parts of their past. They go to the bookbinders and the bookbinders take their memories and preserve it in a book. As a result of this, bookbinders are generally feared and shunned by society though there are some of the privileged few, some of the rich elite who often exploit bookbinders for the service that they provide. I read this uh, summer last year and to be honest with you this kind of low fantasy is not my typical genre, it's not my bag usually at all, but I absolutely loved this and I really loved rereading this. Bridget Collins just spins such an interesting world and story from this concept. I think maybe I enjoy this because I do generally love books about books um, and there are a lot of twists and turns in this story that I didn't always see coming. It has a lot of commentary on the commodification of memory and the dynamics of class and privilege, which I didn't expect going into this. Um, I really, really highly recommend this and I hope that you enjoy it too. Plus, it is the most stunning book that I think I own. If you take a the dust jacket, 
Look at that, and end papers too. Oh, it's just beautiful. It is an object of beauty and the story is beautiful. So highly recommend this. Oh, also a quick shout out to this little thing that I picked up in Tesco. This is the Little People Big Dreams edition of David Attenborough. This is just a picture book mainly for children or for big kids like me and just is a little mini biography of David Attenborough and has such gorgeous, gorgeous pictures in it. I love this series and I really want to pick up more of these. I particularly want to pick up the Audrey Hepburn one. Next to the rest of the books that I read this month, we have Georgina's World, the illustrated Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire by Amanda Foreman. Georgina's World follows the story of Georgina Spencer, who became the Duchess of Devonshire after she married William Cavendish, the fifth Duke of Devonshire, and who together had a famously bad marriage. The two were incredibly incompatible and she kind of consoled herself and distracted herself through parties, fashion, theatre and politics. And gambling, can't forget the gambling and she rose up very quickly to become the trendsetter of 18th century elite society. If this sounds very similar to Marie Antoinette, then you'd be unsurprised to find out that the two of them were actually friends and corresponded with each other. Georgina was well known for being very astute, well-mannered, friendly and charming, but she was also very, very insecure and quite a big people pleaser, and was a woman who was under so much societal pressure and obligation, and this really, really took its toll on her physical and mental health. The Devonshire family were ardent supporters of the Whig party and very much involved in politics of the time. Georgina herself was heavily, heavily involved in political campaigning at a time when women were both not expected and were in fact frowned upon for engaging publicly in politics. She was most heavily active in politics during the 1784 election, so a hundred years before women would really be able to get together en masse and publicly uh, campaign for political rights. Her celebrity status was really used as a mechanism to draw people in, but it also attracted so, so much criticism. Georgina both set a precedent for women engaging in politics publicly, but she was also used as a tool to suppress women from engaging in politics, with many people using her as an example for why women should not engage. She was heavily lampooned by the press for her engagement in the 1784 election especially. She was accused of selling sexual favours in exchange for votes and just generally being morally degenerate for her engagement in politics. I had previously seen the Duchess movie starring Keira Knightley as Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, so I was somewhat aware of aspects of Georgina's life, but I really loved reading this for getting more insight into different aspects of her life, particularly the portrait of Georgina's youth and how that really shaped the woman that she would come to be and particularly the influence of gambling on her life and the amount of debt that she accrued, which really they do not go into so much in The Duchess. Famously in 1789, she was reluctant to leave Paris because she was more scared of her debtors than she was of the revolutionaries that were campaigning and fighting there. It was also really interesting to see the insight into how her physical health was really impacted by her lifestyle and the amount of stress that she was under. Georgina suffered from rheumatism, eye infections, kidney stones, uh, disordered eating and an abscess on her liver, all as a result of the physical toll that her lifestyle took on her. Also a note on this particular edition, this is the illustrated version of the normal biography of Georgina and I just think the illustrations are just such a great addition, they really just give you context for this world. I th I'm a very visual person, so having any sort of visuals just to get my head into that world, I find so, so helpful. And I think more biographies need to come illustrated because this is just such a stunning, stunning biography. It really helps land you in this world. And also the books writing are just very engaging and very accessible. So if even if you are new to this time period, I would highly recommend having a look at this. Next we have Lanny by Max Porter. This is a contemporary literary fiction novel and it takes place in a little town just outside of London. In this book there is a mythical being called Dead Papa Toothwort who listens in on the residents' day-to-day -day lives and grumblings and he is particularly enamoured by a little boy called Lanny who is 
seen as quite odd by many of the residents around him, but he is very, very perceptive and unfailingly honest, and so Dead Papa 2-4 takes a real interest in him. The story generally follows Lanny and his family as they kind of try and work him out. Now, this is a book that I had previously avoided because I'd heard that it was experimental and a bit strange, and I'm not typically a big fan of experimental fiction and particularly not stream of consciousness style, which is what I'd heard this was. This book is probably most well known for little sections where Dead Papa Two Four is listening in on the residents and you just see all of their thoughts emerging on the page as a little bit of a jumble. So the layout, it's kind of thoughts all going curving around the page and that's kind of what I thought the entire book was going to be like and it really isn't like that at all. There are little moments like that but it is mostly just normal prose. I actually feel like this could be quite a good little introduction to literary fiction and slightly more experimental fiction if you are not very used to it as I'm not because it's it's really not that difficult and I'd probably recommend that if you are intimidated by this um, maybe perhaps listen to the audiobook sample of this on Audible and just listen to the slightly more experimental uh, Dead Papa 2-4 moments and that will give you kind of a sense of what Max Porter is trying to do on the page and I think once you have it in your head it will stick and you'll be able to read it physically a lot easier. Once you've got the flow of it it should be quite straightforward. This book in particular talks about the routine mundanity of day-to-day -day life but also the fact that there is so much beauty in that routine that we often take for granted. It's talking about how there is so much history that is alive around you in your day-to-day -day life and we just don't always recognise it. It's about the microaggressions that can often occur in our closest relationships when we really take advantage of each other and don't appreciate the other people in our lives. Something I really liked in this book was the use of multiple different perspectives um, which overlapped on pages because I think it really emphasised how we often perceive that people are not very self-aware of their actions and what they are doing and how they are affecting you but the use of the different perspectives showed that People are often very self-aware of what they are doing and how they are coming across, but they often do not make changes because they feel powerless to break out of their day-to-day -day routines. I actually found this to be such a great read and I enjoyed it so much more than I thought that I would. That being said, it wasn't quite a five star for me. I probably put it on a four star because I wasn't a massive, massive fan of the ending, but still highly recommend. I do really like this. Next is a book that I don't currently own because I did listen to it on audiobook, but hopefully I'll get my hands on it soon, uh, which is Young, Damned and Fair by Gareth Russell. This focuses on the life of Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, who was executed in 1542 on charges of treason and adultery. I was really keen to get to this, uh, as I said in my Tudor TBR, because I thought that this might possibly be portraying Catherine with a slightly more sympathetic depiction than she has had uh, in previous historiography. And I do think it was largely quite a sympathetic portrayal, uh, particularly about her circumstances and her death, but it does not perceive Catherine as being completely faultless in her conduct and definitely falls on the side of her relationships, particularly with Francis Derham and Henry Mannix as being consensual relationships. Whereas I think there has been some recent uh, historiography where people have been talking about maybe these were non-consensual abusive relationships, uh, Gareth Russell falls very much on the side of the evidence points to the fact that she was consenting to what she was doing, even though she was a very young teenager when it occurred. He is very, very critical of the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, who Catherine was living under for not recognising the signs of what was happening with Durham and Mannix. So he's not putting all of the blame at Catherine. Gareth Russell also looks at the evidence and comes to the conclusion that Catherine most likely did not commit physical adultery with Thomas Culpepper when she was married to Henry, but that most likely it was going to happen eventually if they hadn't been caught. Gareth Russell never tries to depict Catherine as being the engineer of her misfortune, but rather that she was a victim of chance, and if any of the things that happened in the sequence of events had been different, she might have been spared the death penalty. This biography is really notable because there is such a massive focus on household records as a source. I think because Gareth Russell did his postgraduate dissertation on the household of Catherine Howard, he really goes all in on these household sources and really interrogates them to 
try and dispel a lot of our common misperceptions of what happened in Catherine Howard's tenure as Queen, really deconstructing the narrative and having a rigorous look at these household sources. And throughout the biography, he really tries to get you into the time period and really wants you to understand the context of every single thing that is happening. So if you are looking for like a very smooth narrative biography of Catherine Howard, you know, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, uh, it's not going to quite provide you that because it goes into so, so much much detail. And it's mainly so that you know the context of how everything was traditionally meant to go so that when there is any sort of deviance from normal order and normal um, business as usual, you understand how that is significant. I really enjoyed it and if you are a big fan of like the interrogation of sources and you like looking at the ambiguities and the difficulties of recording history, this is definitely a biography for you. Finally, we have Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. This is a 19th century classic which tells the story of Bathsheba Everdeen who inherits her uncle's estate and farmlands and basically her journey of taking on this job, working with the different farmers and in particular her relationships with three different admirers. I'll be really honest with you, I have never been all that drawn to this particular classic. I, I don't know why, just the story has never quite appealed to me. However, I did read Tess of the D'Urbervilles a couple of years ago and enjoyed as much as you can enjoy Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Um, so I knew that I liked Hardy's writing and I knew that I liked his style so I wanted to give this a, a good go. But unfortunately this was a little bit of a disappointment to me. I wasn't drawn in just as I hadn't been before. Whilst I really do appreciate Thomas Hardy's writing style, I think he is a fantastic writer, I just was not drawn to any of these characters. I could not care less about them. I always felt like these characters were just a, a little bit too much of a distance from me. Whereas Hardy, you can tell he loves these characters. He pokes fun at them all the time within the narration. He clearly loves them so much and finds them funny, but I could not get myself to care about them. It was kind of like uh, that meme. It's like Thomas Hardy is Edna Mode from The Incredibles, showing off his designs, showing off his characters, and I'm Helen from The Incredibles, just like, I don't see what you see. <laughs> Might potentially watch the film with Carrie Mulligan, but I don't think I'll be picking this up again anytime soon. So that is everything that I've read so far in the month of June. Please do let me know anything that you read. Let me know uh, your opinions about any of the books that I talked about today. I'd love to hear from you. I hope that you're having a fantastic, fantastic day and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye.